Uh, hi everyone, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, just before we start, we've got some messages from our sponsors. So the first message is from BitBio, which is our platinum sponsor and actually the company which today's speaker, Dr. Moreau, works for. So um, here is the message. Today, we have a op unique opportunity to build a bright future. To do so, we need to extend our technical repertoire and transition biology to engineering. Tapping into the potential of biology will accelerate biomedical research, enable new generations of cures, and open up new avenues for increased global sustainability. Founded by Dr. Mark Cotter and Florian Schuster, BitBio is an award-winning human synthetic biology enterprise. BitBio's mission is to code cells for health. To do so, they apply the principles of computation to biology. Their current focus is to develop a scalable technology platform capable of producing consistent batches of every human cell. We'd also like to thank another sponsor, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome editing company which used CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenics-based therapies. As I mentioned earlier, today we are honored to have Dr. Thomas Moreau as our speaker. After a PhD in France working on novel gene and cell therapy approaches to rare immunodeficiencies, Dr. Moreau joined the Cambridge Stem Cell Institute in 2008 to work on a transcription factor-driven cellular reprogramming strategies, primarily for the differentiation of blood lineages from pluripotent stem cells. The research has notably led to a scalable approach for the in vitro production of megakaryocytes and blood platelets from stem cells, which is now being further developed for clinical application in transfusion medicine. After a series of intriguing conversations with Mark Cotter, he joined the Alpis Biomed startup in 2018 which has since become the impressive bit by adventure. Since then, he's been supporting a fast growing fantastic science team, working on the development of the building blocks of our core reprogramming technology and the extension of our cell type portfolio. I will be moderating the question and answer session that will happen after this talk. If you're on YouTube, feel free to post your questions throughout the talk. And if you're on Zoom, you could ask your questions in person at the end, post them on the chat or send them privately to me. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Moreau. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good evening all. I mean, it's a pleasure to uh, finish the week actually by talking to you. I think it's a, a society of uh, enthusiastic scientists and biologists, so that's, that's great to have this uh, opportunity to uh, present what we are doing at BitBio. So you got the, the, the introduction already. Um, it's, it's big times for biology. I mean, the last years have been immensely you know, exciting. There are a lot of new technologies which allow us to to interrogate biology uh, much deeper than than ever, and to manipulate as well um, cells and stem cells in particular in a much better way, and to do to do I mean a, a lot of things that would be useful to to benefit um, human and human health. So BitBio really uh, we are coding cells for our health. Um, like it has been said, you know, we are looking towards generating consistent and scalable human IPS or human prepotent stem cells, derived cells for the next generation of medicine. And really medicine in a broad, uh, broad sense. Um, improving medicine by understanding better biology, providing human cells for researcher to understand mechanisms of disease, mechanisms of normal biology, providing human cells to uh, pharma companies, contract research uh, organization to screen drugs on model which are much more accurate than current animal models and benefit human health by eventually providing human cells that could be used as a cell therapy product. So that's all uh, our ambition at BitBio. And everything we do is really using a very specific approach to differentiation of human prepotent stem cells, which is called cellular reprogramming. I will come to that through the talk. So according to cells for health, uh, we have a core technology which is called Opterix, which is a genetic switch which allows us to control cell identity, stem cell identity. We really want to transition biology, which is noisy for good reason, that uh, allows uh, organisms, cells uh, living to evolve and react to changing environment. But when we want to do biology in a dish, uh, we want to have better control. So we really want to uh, transition biology to engineering to, to allow that. So we've been focusing over the last two years and a half of the company, uh, developing a scalable technology platform to produce consistently very high quality human cells. 
we want to do that, like I said, uh, to allow and, and um, enable better research, better drug discovery, better assessment of uh, toxicology of new molecules. We want to do that to having human cells that could be used to produce um, better bioproducts, you know, being proteins, being vaccines, being antibodies. Uh, there are a lot of uh, sub, um, suboptimal cellular systems which are used nowadays to achieve so. And we want to have the best human cells possible to have advanced cell therapy product for a range of indication. And really the next generation of medicine are certainly to be uh, using cells to cure a range of diseases. Just a bit of introduction of our team. So that's already an old picture, you know, COVID time, we cannot be together again. So it's a more than a year old picture. No? We are um, now a company of more than 100 people. So we've been growing very, very fast over the last year. We've been uh, welcoming two key people that I'm mentioning here because we are moving our ambition very clearly this year as a company towards clinical ambition, generating cell for therapy. So we welcome John Connolly and Rami Ibrahim, who both have worked at the Parker's uh, Institute in the US, are now part of the company. We are doing a lot of science, decoding cell type identity and manipulating stem cells to, to, to make all this functional cell type require a lot of um, excellent scientists. So we've been growing, as you can see here, our team in the last couple of years to 65 scientists. It's a big, big group. And we moved uh, into a brand new building last uh, end of last year on the Babraham Research Campus, a brand new, uh, brand new facilities. And we are actually occupying 25,000 square feet on the first ground of this uh, Dorothy uh, Hodgkin building. That's quite exciting time. That's also a challenge to grow team. That's quickly, but um, that's um, what we need to achieve our ambition. So a bit biocellular programming, what's, what does it mean? I don't know how many of you are stem cell biologists, but iPS cells induced prepotent stem cells since their discovery in 2007, they've really changed uh, the game for biologists, right? They are able to be grown in vitro, ad libidum. You can grow billions of cells uh, if you like, and they have this uh, self-renewing capacities, and they essentially have also critically have this capacity to differentiate. And the field I've been using embryonic stem cells and induced prepotent stem cells, um, following the rules of developmental biology, Stem cells by themselves are interesting for stem cell biologists to understand how stemness is, is controlled, but they're even more interesting for most of the application as differentiated cells. And to achieve this differentiation so far, for the last 25 years since the discovery of embryonic stem cells, direct differentiation approaches have been used, which mean using environmental external cues, growth factors, cytokines, to guide sequentially your stem cells towards the mature cell type of interest. It's typically uh, a long process, a complicated process. You need to use sequentially complex cocktail of cytokines to drive your stem cells sequentially toward the, your, your cell type of interest again. So it's, it's usually hard to reproduce. It's also costly to, to scale up. And there are room for errors. A lot of byproducts are produced um, using this type of technologies. So reprogramming, cellular programming, use transcription factors to really help foster and narrow the, 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 the differentiation of stem cells by, by facilitating the decision a stem cell has to make to reach the final mature cell type by using transcription factors to, to, to guide this process. And classical approach of cellular reprogramming you need to, to, to transfer your transcription factors into stem cells. I've been using viral vectors or other transfection methodology. It's good, that works well. If you have a good transcription factors combination, the essential combination of factors which are going to drive uh, your cell identity of interest, that's going to work well. But still, these vectors are still creating noise, right? If you use viral vectors, every single stem cells are going to receive virtually 
uh, different dose of factors and integrate it in different parts of the genome. So at BitBio, we have a core technology, which is called Opteryx for Optimum Overexpression System. So we can precisely engineer a specific combination of factors to achieve a specific cell identity in a very, a very precise region of the stem cell DNA in the so-called genetic safe harbor uh, loci. And we'll come to that later on. What does it do? I mean, it's really combined uh, the two, two advantage of the um, two, two key advantage, right? Uh, the cellular reprogramming using transcription factors. If you have the precise combination, like I said, you can push your stem cells toward the fate of interest and you have the scalability as well and reproducibility, which is coming from precise engineering of this code into always the same region of your stem cells. So what does it do here? Yeah, might have seen this movie on the website. Maybe I'll stop it here for a while. If you're not familiar with stem cells, that's how stem cells look like in a culture dish. Here you have a colony of stem cells with one, two, three, four, five, and, and so on stem cells that grow as compact uh, pack of cells as clusters, monolayer of cells. And in these stem cells, we've uh, engineered the Opteryx genetic switch with a skeletal muscle code in the form of the MyoD1 transcription factors. So when we switch on this, uh, this code, very rapidly, the stem cells lose their morphology of stem cells. They start, you see, to no longer grow as, as tight clusters, but as single cells which are moving around and very quickly elongate as well. So after five days, so it's stopping now. After five days, you see that your stem cells don't look any more like stem cells that start to acquire the typical muscle morphology. They elongate, they start to fuse to each other and form this, eventually these muscle bundles in only nine days, which is unprecedented in terms of speed of differentiation. And it's very homogeneous as well. Furthermore, these uh, differentiated skeletal muscles are functional. And if you add acetylcholine, which is a classical agonist of muscles, you see that all your muscles, cells contract and detach from the surface of the worm. So just that, just one example, and one of our first example of what we could achieve with Opteryx uh, in the company, and of course, I'll show you uh, later on in the talk uh, how much more we've had achieved so far. But that's what cellular reprogramming can achieve. This very rapid, very high purity differentiation of stem cells because you guide your stem cells with transcription factors. Just wanted to now um, bring you to a little bit of uh, our core technology and, and tell you what, what they are and how that work. As a, as a cell biologist, I've always been fascinated by the variety of uh, shapes, forms in nature, you know, from plant to animals. And if you go a bit deeper at the level of, of cells, the variety and number of colors of, of cells, you know, the, the, the variety of shapes and function from a bone cells, which is very hard to a red blood cells, very fluid to neurons, which are, you know, extending arms nearly dendrites, nearly one meter long through your body, there are this immense variety of cells. How and the way these varieties code and control is actually, I find it quite fascinating. It keeps um, keep me um, keep uh, wonder in my eyes. And that all starts, all this variety from one stem cell. One stem cell. Here, what you see is a development of a newt. And at the very first stage of the life of a newt, it's one stem cells dividing to gradually to, to build this more complex embryo and going through this key stage, for instance, embryonic development here you, you're witnessing now, which is called gastrulation. When you reach this stage of several tens of thousands of cells, the embryos start to invaginate and the internal the cells in the um, inside of the, of the embryo are going to form eventually your body. So that's really when the cells are exposed to a variety of signals, interpret the signals and become, become this variety of cells which are eventually going to produce these uh, quite wonderful multicellular organisms with all this variety of, of cell function. That's really what we want to be able to control better in a dish for this human cellular model, control the cellular diversity from a stem cell. 
And we also want to do it at scale because we want to be able to uh, produce billions of cells to, to feed drug discovery pipelines, but eventually to help regenerative medicine to happen, to have enough cells to transplant to patients, to really help democratize uh, cell therapy, which, like I said at the beginning, is, is the next generation of medicine. And that will be, we do believe, will be possible by cellular programming. And things change, you know, in, uh, in biology in 2007, when uh, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, that's, as you probably know, has received a, a Nobel Prize in Medicine, has discovered in 2007 that the expression of four genes, four transcription factors, into skin cells, or actually any cell from a, a, an adult body, or a formed individual, the re-expression of the four transcription factors could actually revert completely the clock and bring these adult cells into uh, the state of prepotent stem cells, very similar to the first cells of, uh, of you, of your life, and embryonic stem cells. So that's really demonstrated that there was something very powerful uh, using transcription factors to manipulate cell identity. And as you can appreciate here, in terms of number of publication in peer-reviewed paper, after the discovery of reprogramming, the number of publication using transcription factors to manipulate cell identity has, has just exploded. And that really has changed, you know, a, a very uh, long-lasting paradigm in biology, which is which was that once a stem cell or progenitor cell is differentiated, that's it. That's a dead end, you know. That's this uh, Waddington landscape here. That when your stem cells roll down the hill, it's stuck in this particular hill and cannot change its identity any further. But what reprogramming has told us is that by using transcription factors, you can manipulate the cell identity and that the facto cell identity is metastable. It's not something written in stone. Cells can move from one state to the other. So that was quite a revolution. So now over the last um, 13, 14 years, a lot of reprogramming methods have been developed to, to differentiate um, stem cells or fibroblast many actually towards a variety of cell types. When I say so actually, the variety is uh, quite limited. There are about 30 cell types which have been produced by cellular reprogramming approaches, mainly neuronal cell type or cardio, cardiac cell type and a variety of others, but but really it's actually quite limited when you think that there are now um, about several thousands of cell identity and, and especially subsets of cell identity which have been identified over the last years through single cell um, RNA seq technologies, for instance. So there are a lot to discover. It's very powerful technology, but a lot of cellular code to be discovered still. So at BitBio, we have two key technologies. Uh, touched upon that um, before, we have this Optirix, Optirix genetic switch. It's uh, embedded into stem cells DNA, and it's a switch, it's quite agnostic, right? You can put downstream of this switch, the transcription factors code, the cell identity code you like. And if you put norogen into, for instance, you would get glutamatergic neurons. If you put another transcription factors like MyoD1, I showed you the movie before, you will get skeletal myocyte. So the switch is the same, the code is different. But this switch gives you full control of the code from the stem cell stage. But like I said just a slide before, there are many, many codes that have still to be discovered. So we knew from the very early days of BitBio that we would need to develop a very strong discovery, very powerful discovery platform to identify in a high throughput way uh, the variety of, of, of code for the variety of cell type that we want to eventually achieve. So I'll just go into a bit more details about what this Optix switch is. It's been uh, fully published. It's a stem cell report 2017. You could have a look at if you like. But this switch is actually quite simple, or at least is using a very well-known inducible uh, system, which is a Teton system. Teton system has two main components, um, transactivators protein, the RTTN, and a responsive uh, inducible cassette responding to RTTA. 
upon dox uh, tetracycline tetracycline sorry derivative additions and typically these two components of a tetan systems are expressed from a single cassette but the problem is that in stem cells this inducible cassette this element inducible element is very easily silenced which means that you lose control of your gene expression so what the OptiX is all about is actually just splitting the two components of a tetan system into two different regions of the stem cell DNA. They're called genetic self arbor loci, which means that they're protected from silencing and they're actually not damaging the biology of stem cells. And these two elements of the tetan system are, are cloned separately in ROSA26 and AVS1 typically. And what it does actually is that it protects very well this inducible cassette which is controlling a specific code for specific cell identity from this silencing agent so that gives you a much better control of your code and there are no leakiness as well so your your code which is going to push your stem cells to differentiate is not expressed until you add a simple very very um, basic antibiotics doxycycline to your dish. So in absence of these antibiotics, your code is not expressed, your stem cells grow as stem cells. And like I said at the beginning, nowadays we can grow stem cells at scales. We can grow billions of them if need be. But as soon as you add doxycycline, you switch on your transcription factors code and you can get uh, push all your stem cells in a very synchronous way toward the cell type of interest. And like as I alluded to before, if you change the code, of course, you change the cell identity. You are published in the paper, you could see that you, you can see uh, glutamatergic neurons, oligodendrocytes, which are supportive cells for neurons, or skeletal myocytes that you've seen on the movie. So that's the switch. I said we need to find the codes. How do we do that in a nutshell? I'm not going to enter into too much details here. But in many instances for the cell type we want to make a bit bio, we have no clue about what are going to be the key transcription factors needed to achieve this differentiation. So the workflow looks a little bit like that. So we ask our bioinformatician uh, to select for the cell type of interest, predict or shortlist a bunch of transcription factors. So typically 50 transcription factors, which are very likely to be the main master regulators of the cell um, identity we are targeting. And we're using different algorithms here to, to, to minimize the risk of missing the key regulators. But we end up with a library of 50 transcription factors. We don't want and we can't and we don't need uh, biologically for cellular programming. We don't need to express these 50 transcription factors all together into a stem cells to make the differentiation happen. What um, is typically needed, it's one to five transcription factors acting in combinations to make the reprogramming to happen. So we want to, from this 50, to go down to this narrow, uh, minimal and sufficient combination of factors to make the reprogramming and, and make it happen in a, with a sort of optic system. So the way we do that is that we use uh, vectorology to distribute randomly in millions, tens of millions of stem cells these 50 transcription factors library um, dosing very very precisely to get achieve this one to five transcription factors combinations randomly distributed into stem cells and covering the combinatorial space so interrogate every possible combinations and when you do so very rarely you will have a few combinations which actually work and your stem cells will start to differentiate and you we there, there are ways to to um, detect this and to look very precisely into these stem cells that showed sign of differentiation toward the cell type of interest to detect precisely which combination the stem cells has initially received and what is the quality of the phenotype uh, you've achieved. All of that is done typically by single cell transcriptomic approach. That requires quite a lot of uh, computational biology power which is, uh, which is done again by our team. And it really allows us to go down to, to the critical combinations that needs then to be expressed from our OptioX genetic switch. Just the flag here that uh, as biologists, as stem cell biologists, we're all very excited by this discovery screen because this circle is very virtuous. And 
generate a lot of um, magical data which actually don't exist yet in the field. There are a lot of perturbation screen using transcription factor combinations, but not with this resolution and not with this as systematic in terms of um, probing the effect of combination of transcription factors onto uh, the phenotype of stem cells. And combination is very important here. That's what we focus our attention to. So that's it. We discover new combination and make new OptiOx model. That's still a long process. It takes about uh, a year and a half uh, to get there. But we are constantly evolving this platform to compress the timeline uh, each time we do it. Just an example of what we can achieve through these discovery uh, programs. So that was our historical discovery program with hepatocytes, which are liver cells. They're very interesting for, for, for many, many different applications. One of them is uh, hepatotoxicology. Um, so a lot of drugs, um, all drugs actually have to be tested on hepatocytes to, to evaluate their, their toxicity. And all the pipeline are using at the minute immortalized cell line, which are not that good. So there are clear, clear demand for very good functional IPS derived hepatocytes that would help us also to mimic uh, human diversity in a dish and be better at predicting uh, side effect of drugs. So yeah, hepatocyte very useful, but that still difficult to achieve at scale and, and consistently. So that was a good um, test bed for discovery platform. And what you can see here, it's a typical sort of, um, you know, map we get from single cell uh, transcriptomics showing the specific combination of transcript factors expressed in every single cells and the quality of the phenotype of the hepatocyte achieved. So it's, it's sort of, uh, of, uh, of code, uh, code maps that we have here. And based on that, by applying different uh, computational biology approaches, we can devise uh, gene regulatory networks with core candidates which are driving this hepatocyte identity. After that, we uh, do validate. Uh, in that instance, we identify four key transcription factors out of the 50 screens that really gave us uh, in the dish uh, real hepatocyte expressing, as you can see here with some fluorescent reporters, key enzymes uh, linked to hepatocyte metabolic activities. And when we go, we can interrogate the data, it's a large data set in, uh, in, from any direction, but these four transcription factors also give rise to hepatocyte expressing all the key enzymes that we're expecting to see in functional hepatocyte and able to uh, metabolize a large uh, set of drugs. So that's just an example of discovery. Now I'm going to drive you through uh, for the next 10 minutes or so through uh, what we've achieved in terms of a variety of cell types and how we, we, how we do work at BitBio in terms of, uh, you know, putting the bar fairly high in terms of cell quality. And that's maybe also a principle we are, we are working with each type we do a new, a new cell types. We want to achieve all these goals uh, for every cell types. We want to have cells which are consistent. So we want to be sure that each time we provide, let's say an hepatocyte for, for drug screening, in today or in two years time, it will be the exact same quality of hepatocyte. And we do believe that with Opteryx and cellular programming, it's absolutely achievable. So high consistency. I purity as well. We want cells which are typically above 80% pure, which is uh, difficult to achieve with um, standard process of direct differentiation, but that we've uh, reliably and, and uh, now several times achieved by cellular reprogramming with Optirix. We want to make it at scale. So if uh, drug screening needs billion cells, uh, that's something we want to be able to do. And there's no practical limit in terms of um, Really scaling up our, our, our cell production with the optics system, you can appreciate that every single stem cell is having the optics um, optics genetic switch, so you can grow and all differentiate synchronously. We are, uh, of course, super careful about the quality of our cells, so we test all of them functionally. Do they at least achieve the minimal function we are expecting from a specific cell types? We want the cells to differentiate very quickly. I've showed you the myocyte differentiating in a matter of nine days, 
versus amounts typically with classical differentiation protocol. So that's something that uh, is typically achieved by serial programming. And we're on sites which are really easy to use. Um, even for, you know, academic labs we um, and, and pharma, we want, we deliver cells as a cryopreserved format and we want them to be ready to use using very simple culture conditions in a matter of days. So that's all sort of um, prerequisite. So to achieve that, every single cell type we make is actually deeply characterized. So we do deep genetic quality controls. We do classical immunostaining to at the first pass for, for, for the phenotype of the cell of interest. We do a standard RNA sequencing characterization, deep characterization of our cells, bulk and single cell. And we, and that's more bespoke aspect of uh, every single program, we do assess functionality of cells for the best, um, for the minimal um, critical functions you want to see for a specific cell type. We also do just a more of a practical reason, do package cells in cryo preserved tubes in two formats. We have small and large vial size that really allow uh, any customers, academic or pharma to, to, to get the right amount of cells and not uh, not lose any anything um, from the product. So I'll give you a few examples now. So the first product was uh, our IO glutamatergic neurons. So glutamatergic neurons produced by cellular programming. And in a nutshell, what we do in BitBio for all cell types is we prime the cells, our cells toward the, the cell fate of interest for a few days, typically three to four days, and cryopreserve the cells then before shipping to, to, to customers to use the labs. And that's what you receive. So when you saw your cells, these glutamatergic neurons, you have very rapidly maturing neuronal networks forming, high viability. And you see that already after a week in culture, you have a, a, a fairly dense neural networks in your dish that you can interrogate. So that's very easy to use. We've done uh, quite a lot on this model to understand the biology behind the reprogramming. That's data coming from bulk RNA sequencing time course. So you see very high density time course. You see three biological replicates. And over time, you see that these um, replicates behave very much the same and acquire uh, sequentially a neuronal identity, which is um, which is stabilized after two weeks in culture. But what is remarkable here that all reproducible is a process. Again, three biological replicate, barely visible on this um, principal component analysis. But current sequencing uh, data also showed us, <clears throat> sorry, the, the root of reprogramming. And you can see here that actually the stem cells go at a very fast pace through a fairly normal um, uh, glutamatergic neurons development. So going through this neural progenitor cells stage before stabilizing a pan-neuronal identity with mature glutamatergic genes. All these data, by the way, are available to, to any users. So we are very happy to share this type of data. Because, I mean, we all know that, you know, uh, biological models can be compl complicated and you can ask very specific questions. Every user may want to know if some specific gene uh, set of genes are expressed or not. So we are very open in terms of, of quality and data for cells. These glutamatic neurons are also ready uh, very quickly for use. So two days after revival, once you receive your crop reserve uh, vials, you can already use them for, for a range of assays. They're very pure, express classical glutamatic um, neurons. And by very pure, actually, I, I mean above 80% glutamatic neurons and a range of non glutamatergic neurons, cholinergic neurons, which are always below 20%, and that consistently observed and uh, always QC'd by single cell sequencing. They're also functional, so that, um, that's uh, multi electrode arrays measuring electrophysiological activities from glutamatergic neurons networks after 20 days of culture. And you can see in different wells that electrical ac activities is detected, while after 50 days, of a directed differentiation protocol of cortical neurons, so very similar to what we are doing, 
no or barely any electrical activities is detected. That's not even done by us. That has been tested um, separately, independently by uh, Charles River Laboratory. Importantly as well, with neurons, you want to have this functional neuronal network and you want to test drug on it and see if the drugs are having an impact on the way uh, the signal is transmitted between neurons. And what, uh, that has been um, validated in a collaborative lab from the University of Cambridge. You can see that um, this very regular spike indicating mature neuronal networks can be interfered with using classical drug of uh, blocking the uh, synaptic uh, channels. And that's published again. And another very important um, aspect of this model is that the neuroglutamatergic neurons mature very quickly. And already two weeks post thawing, you have half of the culture, uh, what I'm saying here, no, sorry. We have the, the mature tau isoform, tau being a very important uh, protein linked to uh, frontal temporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease. This 4R um, adult version of top protein is expressed after two weeks in culture only, which typically takes 80 to 100 days with classical differentiation protocol. So here you have a functional, mature, adult like neural network you can interrogate. And all of this has been further validated, like I said, and I showed you before, by our uh, partner, Treasurer Laboratories. They're one of the biggest uh, CRO in the world, and they're really stress testing our models in their drug screening pipelines. And they've been uh, very happy and so sharing this, uh, this very good result through conferences. And that's one, one example of a poster. So we know they can be used uh, for drug screening pipeline. Of course, that's only one type of neurons. There are plenty of neurons in the brain. So we have a pipeline, development pipeline for for other um, subtype and types of neurons and glia, so supporting cells for the neuronal networks uh, that we are developing right now. One example which of product in development soon to be launched, uh, GABAergic neurons, they're uh, inhibitory neurons compared to glutamatergic neurons, which are excitatory neurons. So they work really together. And um, that's what you, you, you can see here that we have a proof of principle that we can make very pure gaba neuron sculpture expressing classical marker like GABA and VGAT1. We do single cell sequencing, like I told you, we are very pleased to see that the key uh, gaba markers, especially in, in mature cells here, are expressed, but non gaba markers for glutamatic neurons, uh, cholinergic neurons and dopaminergic, dopaminergic neurons are not expressed in our culture. So it's a very pure GABAergic culture. So we can achieve single cell sequencing are great because you can also go deeper. It's not only GABAergic neurons as a, as a mixed uh, bag. You can go deeper and say that's GABAergic neurons of the VIP subset. So we can really provide um, maximum information for biology and science to, to be um, to happen uh, with accuracy. Functional, uh, these um, GABA neurons are functional. You should see a movie here, it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't matter, let's say. And yeah, I'll share a movie with you. That's how it looks like when you throw these GABA neurons in your dish. They're actually cryopreserved as clumps. So every cell type has its own, you know, requirements. Gabagic neurons need to be frozen as clumps of cells. But you see that very rapidly, and that's only yeah, three days after thawing, your gabagic neurons again very viable and start to connect with each other very rapidly. So that looks like a very, very promising uh, cell types of soon available. We've been doing other cell type as well. So that's oligodendrocyte, that these cells which myelin, um, myelin um, nate, sorry, that's always a word I'm struggling to say, the uh, axon of your neuron. So very important for the maturity of your neural networks. So that's a uh, work in progress. Bulk well, sequencing are showing that we can achieve very mature oligodendrocyte after two weeks in culture. But we all know, I mean, that's very nice, you know, to have very pure, scalable neuronal 
and glia cell types in your dish. But if you want to achieve very precise biological models, you actually want to mix the cell types. Like I said, brain is made of a variety of neurons and glia. So co-culture, as you probably know, is uh, the next stage for, for tissue culture. So we can do it by just mixing cells in a dish in 2D system, but it's even better if we can produce actually precisely architectured 3D tissues. And uh, we've been um, in uh, close collaboration with the University of Oxford and Agan Bailey Lab to test all cells, the biocells, for bioprinting. And that's a published uh, paper from last year showing that glutamatergic neurons from BitBio can be bioprinted with astrocyte to create very precise three-dimensional structure. So there are a lot of, uh, of future in that that we are exploring further as we speak. That's the neuronal space. We've also uh, done some myocytes. You would not be surprised. You've seen the movie. A little bit of the same principle here, four days in culture, cryopreservation, and you revive your cells. They're making these nice myofibers very quickly. That's in a matter of a week. So you see long fibers, multinucleated, sign of maturity. They express all the key protein of the myofilament, so very pure culture. One protein, which is especially important for skeletal myocytes, when you want to do this model, like uh, studying dystrophies, for instance, Duchenne muscular dystrophies, you want to see dystrophin expression. And, and this IO ma skeletal myocytes are expressing dystrophin very well. In your dish, you see that these skeletal myocytes are contracting spontaneously, even without adding acetylcholine. So that scared a few people in BitBio, to be honest, just looking down the, the well, they were not prepared. But that's, that's a sign of function, as well as this accumulation of nuclei in the fibers, like I, I, I showed you before. So very pure uh, and mature muscles. That's good for a model. Not just a little bit of a derailment here. Um, we have been working since the beginning of BitBio with this uh, sister company called Meetable, which is a Dutch company, which are working in the field of cultured meat or cellular meat. And we've been partnering very early on because we always uh, we very directly see actually the power of the Opteryx uh, system to scale the production of, of cellular meat from animal stem cells. And Recently, last so we've been working two years together. We've been developing uh, porcine-derived pluripotent stem cells, having the myogenic codes, and demonstrated that we can, as well with porcine iPS cells, make beautiful muscle fibers. We could also make adipocytes to fight cells from these animal pluripotent stem cells using the Opteryx programming. And when you mix the two fat and muscles, metabol have been able to achieve actually the first cellular sausage made of 95% uh, cultured cells, which is a first, uh, first in the world, first in the industry for cellular meat. And they're now producing above kilograms of cell mass um, with this opteric cells. So that's, that's very cool. I think that's part of uh, what we want to achieve at BitBio as well in terms of uh, sustain sustainability goals. And that's also demonstrate the, the scalability of the system. So that's for sausage, but you can imagine that this scalability with human cells can also provide uh, big advantages for cell therapy application. Now we'll uh, finish on disease models. So what I showed you is how we could control a variety of cell types and the work we are doing right now. But working with wild type cells is um, not always the main objective. You know, you want to have um, cells, which iPS cells, which reproduce uh, the disease to understand disease mechanisms. So we've been working over the last year on once we have a code for a particular cell types, have a pipeline using typical CRISPR technologies to create all isogenic cell lines for specific mutation when they are linked to a specific disease, or using patient-derived iPS cells to um, and engineer the optic score to provide reliable models to study disease. So again, just to show that we have a pipeline in place now, we could really uh, engineer precise limitation, doing the relevant genetic QC and differentiate the cells and providing a new disease model. 
we do believe that uh, uh, the quality of our cells will really offer easy to use and, and unique models. For instance, for glutamate rich neurons, we've started to um, generate disease uh, cell models for Parkinson disease, frontotemporal dementia, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and Huntington disease, to all be useful in their own way to understand the disease. And like I said, glutamate rich neurons are fairly uh, mature very quickly, they're functional and they're defined, so that will help to understand better disease. Skeletal myocytes, we are working towards uh, new disease models too, and the big advantages in our models, including expression of dystrophin and our expression of a glucose transporter like GLUT4, which um, there's no uh, good skeletal muscle, human skeletal muscle available on the market nowadays. And our cell seems to express the key protein to, to do good disease modeling. I think that's where we are progressing. We're also developing tools that could uh, benefit uh, not only industry, but also academic labs. IPS cells with specific optiox score to make a specific uh, cell type expressing cr uh, CRISPR. So that's uh, cell, uh, cells to be uh, launched soon, CRISPR ready cells. You could then start to do functional genomic studies uh, with very high quality human cell models very easily. So that's something that will come in the end of the year or next year. So take home. So I might have been a little bit long, but we are coding cells for else. That's, that's our mission. And really everything starts by being able to decode the essential cell identity and using our Opteryx uh, genetic switch to make reliable human cell models. We really want to be, that's all based on cellular programming approach. We really want to be at the age uh, um, of this revolution of being able to manipulate cell identity and, and, and really progress the cellular programming field. We are producing, as you've seen, interested in producing human cell models that could be used in dishes for research, drug discovery and toxicology. And we are moving fast now towards, uh, especially three cell types that we want to push toward uh, cell therapy indication. Uh, in the next couple of years and and that's that's a big uh, big ambition and something which we do believe is achievable with our type of technology especially for the given the consistency and scalability of the system so thank you very much for your attention i just wanted to bring last that we are a very open company we are having a lot of programs with uh, in partnership with academics um, Please, if you're interested by all science, by all product, do uh, contact us. We can do a lot of things together. Um, you can order sales directly or through AppCam. So our sales are distributed by, by AppCam and uh, other companies soon. And if you're academics, you will have even discounts. So please do, um, do try our sales. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Moreau, for such a stimulating talk. Uh, I have a few questions that have been sent to me, uh, if you'd like to answer them. Oh, so related to what, what you just mentioned, actually, um, someone asked, how did you take the plunge from academia to industry, especially mm -hmm. into a brand new startup? Do you have any tips for young researchers apprehensive about such a move? So um, how do I take the plunge? Uh, it was really the, the trigger was the science that we would be doing in VidBio. I've been very much reassured uh, from the early days by uh, our founder, Mark Cotter, um, that this project quite naturally would require quite a lot of stem cell biology. And um, that's, that's what triggered me. I mean, I, my, my sparkle is in science and doing science. So that's, uh, that was an easy, um, fairly easy move. Um, so I think it's all the recommendation. I don't know if I can give any which is just widely applicable, but I think the sparkles, you know, what is really your interest, you know, uh, uh, what is fascinating you in the science you want to do in the biology, what is, it is possible in any environment, you know, it could be academia or industry, as long as you, you dig and you, you get to this level of certainty that what your mission is going to be about, about in any environment is going to match your, your passion and wonder. I think, you know, industrial academia are both 
can be both a quite good. And the startup, you know, is not as well like jumping into a big pharma company. There are a lot of, of creation and creativity that uh, are happening in the early days and a lot of learning. So that's, that's quite an exciting journey. And maybe last thing I would add is, you, you know, it is nowadays, and boundaries between academia and industry are loser and loser. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's probably easier nowadays to jump from academia to industry than it was 10 or 15 years before. Um, sort of related to that, um, someone asked, would you say that it becomes more important every year for biologists to be multi-field scientists? And they asked about uh, learning to code and learning engineering principles. Hmm. Well, that's true that biology has, has changed uh, massively. There's a lot, a lot of, of, of technologies around. Um, I think the more you know, Swiss tool you are, the more the more exposure to to these new technologies you manage to gather, uh, the better you you'll be. Um, but science is complicated nowadays, which so you need to be well surrounded. You know, I mean, picking the the, the right people, having a sort of multidisciplinary t teams surrounding you and your project to achieve the goal is is, is quite critical actually because. It thinks things are becoming uh, complex. Yeah. Okay, I got a couple of questions from the YouTube comment section here. So someone said, "Would you mind giving more examples of how the functions of cells are tested? How are animal models involved?" Could you repeat? Sorry, I did not get the the end of the question. Uh, uh, the end with are animal models involved? So, at the end of the, our research, is there any animal uh, model involved? Is that the question? It's, yeah, it's just how, how do you test the functions of cells and okay. do you use animal models? Okay, so we want to limit as much as possible the use of animal models. It's, it's really depend. There's no one single answer to that question. Um, for glutamatergic neurons, we did not use any animals. For clinical indication, clinical assets we are developing right now, there, there won't be, you know, with the current state of science and safety model, efficacy model, there won't be other choice than using animal models to, to prove the, the efficacy and safety of our cell therapy product. Um, but yeah, eventually, I mean, we do hope that uh, providing accurate, you know, consistent human models will uh, really help to uh, use less animals through, through research. Uh, another one from the issue comment section. In the multi-type neuron systems, uh, how is the formation of the systems controllable i.e. what characteristics the model possesses and how the multiple types are connected? Wow, that's a deep question. That could take hours to, to, to reply, but um, I mean, maybe I take this angle, you know, there are two ways to, to, to come back to the bioprinting. There are two ways to do, uh, or maybe more, but it's too extreme to the co-cultures to put your two cell types together. You know, a typical co-culture for, for neuronal networks would be to put glutamatergic neurons or gabagic neurons with uh, these key glia cells, astrocytes. And you put the two in equal amount in the dish, and that helps, you know, uh, to sustain your neuronal activity and gets to, to a bit more mature uh, neurons. But that's still quite, quite primitive. And again, this co-culture system in each way, it's different. Each time you do the experiment, you know, the cells will connect differently and so on and so forth. So that's where the bioprinting um, will help to get more precise, more consistent and reliable connection between neurons and proportion and distribution, uh, special distribution of, of, of you know, neural subtypes. And one thing which is interesting, for instance, in, um, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so pardon me if I'm not, you know, cannot go that deep. Um, but one thing which is missing in, in the very exciting field of um, brain organoids, you know, you take a stem cells, you let it grow for, for 100 days, even several years now. And, and, and that's required quite well, the brain diversity, but there are still key bottlenecks in terms of reproducibility for sure, but even the cell content, you know. Uh, you will get this astrocyte I just talked about uh, happening fairly late in the process, and especially happening as pockets, you know, and astrocytes are not so much migratory. So we'll have pocket of astrocyte in your structure, so not well distributed. Or you'll have oligodendrocytes, which myelinate uh, this uh, neuron um, 
and then rights happening arising only 150 days after after you the uh, inception of your brain organoids so by bioprinting so you know combining the precision of bioprinting and the control of cell identity with optics we really do hope to make this brain organoids to talk about that or brain printoids sometimes we call them uh, much more precise so bring neurons with astrocytes properly distributed and with oligodendrocytes which are there from day zero instead of coming 150 days later so that's that's where we could regain um, much more control on, on architecture of uh, 3d tissues um speaking of organoids someone in the youtube comment section asked what is your opinion on using organoids uh, for developing disease treatments, and does BitBio have any plans to create organoids? So, like I said, we are very much interested in bioprinting technologies. So, we want, we, we think you know that it goes well with uh, our, our willingness to control better cell identity. So, controlling better cell identity and and tissue architecture seems quite logical. Uh, and things to go together. Uh, so, yeah, we have a plan to move in that direction. Um, for drug testing, I think that co-culture means better biology, so we produce better, you know, I mean, there, their purity is good in a system, but it's also at the same time, you know, can be your, could be a foe, you know, and not, not helping you that much because cells or tissues are never pure you know the, the cells discuss with each other i mean talk to each other and support each other so co-culture will, will represent better biology so better biology means it's good for everything for this is model and for drug testing right uh, but drug testing is a um, is a difficult beast to to feed all these drug screening pipelines because you want uh, reproducibility and if organoids are, are better biologically, they are very hard to reproduce. So there are a lot of people, of course, working in, in, in steroids or aggregating in a very controlled way, stem cells will create more and more consistently the same organoids each time. But again, I think that print weights will, will help. And um, and even more, you know, uh, all these print weights and assembloids will uh, one day uh, possibly allow uh, the transplantation of um, IPS derived complex structure. Why not, you know, from kidney structures so and so on so forth. Um, someone asked, what do you think is the most exciting use of induced pluripotent stem cells to treat disease? Cool. If I'm biased and I'm, I start from my hematology background, I would say, you know, uh, producing hematopoietic stem cells and from IPSCs and being able to to replace bone marrow transplantation um, sounds quite good. But I mean, there, there, are, there are many, many application of, uh, of uh, iPSCs, you know, for, for, for the, to the clinic. There are many obstacles uh, still, you know, uh, quality of differentiation, scalability of the differentiation is a big one that uh, we really want to, to, to tackle. Um, after the IPS uh, safety, you know, uh, genetic stability, I think that uh, everybody working with IPS cells for clinic have to pay atten attention to. But of course, it's um, nowadays genetic engineering of IPSCs is, is, is not that difficult. So it's mainly getting the, you know, being creative and getting the right ideas to ultimately the, the goal would be to have a off the shelf IPS derived cell type which would be universal, so not, not generating any immune response, compatible, universal co compatibility, and, um, and sort of uh, protecting this uh, also disadvantage of universality uh, with probing with, um, card, sorry, combining with safety switches, right? Being able to, if anything goes wrong with an IPS derived uh, graft, being able to, to remove it uh, through, through suicide gene, for instance. If you go around in the literature, we'll see a lot of, uh, of ideas around this. Does anyone have any other questions, Thomas? No? Uh, well, in that case, thank you so much, Thomas, for such an interesting talk and for being so willing to answer our questions at the end. Um, no problem. And as he said, um, 
uh, Cambridge Biosoc and BitBio are hoping to establish a long-term partnership. So if any of our members are interested in getting in contact or um, just asking any questions, just please make sure to get in touch. And I will hand over to Yi Jing, who will outro the talk. Thank you very, uh, very much, Dr. Mora, for your um, for explaining the very exciting and impressive technologies um, happening and developed by Bitbio. Um, like Melon mentioned, yes, if if anyone has more questions about um, Bitbio's technology, uh, you could contact us, or if, if you want, you could you know directly contact Bitbio to um, understand more about um, those technologies. So um, thank you very much, um, everyone who joined us on YouTube and who asked questions on Zoom as well. Um, and before we um, end the talk, I would just like to promote our last talk of the term, which is going to happen um, next Wednesday uh, at 6 p.m., which is by Dr. Zhao Xiu from um, the Institute of Metabolic Science uh, at Cambridge. And the talk is entitled, Is Obesity a Choice? So um, thank you very much again, Dr. Morrell, for the very interesting talk. And I hope to see you all uh, at our next talk. Thank you very much indeed for listening and for the invitation. <laughs>